everyone, welcome. So tonight we are very fortunate to hear from Dr. Michelle Bacris. Um, Dr. Michelle Bacris is a professor of economics at Christopher Newport University in Virginia. She obtained her BA in economics from William and Mary and her PhD from George Mason University. Before teaching, she worked for 10 years at the US Borough of Labor Statistics in the International Price Program, working on export and import price indexes. She has served as a consultant on international statistics for the International Monetary Fund and has been the president of the, v of the Virginia Association of Economics and a member of the Mont Pelion Society. Her field of interest include industrial organization and industrial economics, and her research includes economic freedom, public choice, teaching, pedagogy, and Jane Austen. Please give a warm round of applause for Dr. Michelle Backers. Well, thank you, Skylar, for that nice introduction, and thank you to, to the center for hosting me. Very excited to be here today to talk about uh, my book uh, that I've co-authored with Cecil Bohannon from Ball State University, Pride and Profit, The Intersection of Jane Austen and Adam Smith. I've had a lovely weekend here in Charleston, and this is a nice way for me to, to end things. Uh, so thank you all for coming out this evening. So why Jane Austen and Adam Smith? After all, Smith uh, lived in the 1700s. He's most, what, most known for his book, The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776. But his earlier work was Theory of Moral Sentiments from 1759. That's the, the focus, that, that, that's the book that we're going to be looking at in, our, in, our, in the Austen and Smith book, mostly. And then Jane Austen was a bit younger than him. Uh, she published six novels between uh, the years 1811 and 1818, mostly about the uh, uh, troubles of uh, relatively impoverished gentry women trying to find matches in marriage. So roughly speaking, Austen could have been maybe a, a daughter or granddaughter. Smith could have been her an older father or younger grandfather to Austen. Um, and yet we contend that they have a lot in common. We contend that you can learn a lot about Adam Smith by reading Austen, and you can learn a lot about Jane Austen by reading Adam Smith. Uh, we, we, we see Smith's moral theory coming to life in Jane Austen's novels, in her plots, in her characters. So Austen, not, she doesn't just channel Smith, but she embellish, embellishes, refines, and brings Smith to life. Now, before I uh, get started here, I'd like to just sort of take a quick show of hands. Uh, have any of you um, read any of Jane Austen's books? <coughs> All right, well, that's a, that's a good number of you then. All right. Um, how about maybe seen the movie ad adaptations if you haven't read the books? Right, that's okay. I, that, that's not cheating. Um, this is my favorite adaptation of uh, a, a, a Jane Austen book. It's a... Uh, Alicia Silverstone as the Valley Girl version of Emma. This is the most recent one that I've seen. I don't know, it was in and out of the theaters pretty quickly, but uh, I figured if I'm, if I'm writing a book, if I have a book on Jane Austen, I've got to see Jane Austen uh, in uh, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. It was surprisingly close to the book, you know, except for the zombie part, but the, the, the actual text of the, 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 the screenplay was based on the actual uh, language from Austen, so. I do recommend if, if you uh, can see that on Netflix or something. All right, so why Jane Austen and Adam Smith, but more importantly, why should we care today? Well, we, uh, we, 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 we say that um, Smith's moral theory has relevance for today. A bumper sticker version is, is here. Uh, Smith, uh, according to Smith, we want to be loved but we also want to be worthy of that love. We want, to be, we want to be praised, but we also want to be praiseworthy. In other words, we want to like, look in the mirror and like what we see. That's the basis of, Ms. of Smith's moral theory. But just as in Austin and Smith's time and today, we get deceived by our own self-delusions. Virtue and vice are remarkably the same over the, over the years. And both Smith and Austin were keenly interested in how to live a moral life 
in a world full of temptation. And we think that sounds familiar. So we don't uh, presume any knowledge of Smith and Austin ahead of time, so it's a very user-friendly book. And I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through Smith's moral philosophy and then how it's reflected in Austin's characters and plots. So Smithian virtue, we describe it as the holy trinity of PB and J, prudence, benevolence, and justice. And those virtues are rooted in something called self-command. Self so I'm going to walk you through each of those virtues in turn. First, prudence. So a prudent person takes care of himself. You know, when you're prudent, you don't spend too much um, beyond your means. You don't take any unnecessary risks. Y you mind your own business. There's, there's a, the, the prudence is, is, can make you a little boring, I suppose. A, a prudent person wouldn't go out all night drinking, what are those, nitro teenies at, at uh, uh, Grill 225, right? And, and regret it the next day. So, again, a prudent person might seem kind of boring, but Smith maintains that we act prudently because we're afraid of, of, of losing our security. Smith says that we suffer more when we fall from a higher position to a lower position than we gain from moving up in our, st in our social standing. So since we're afraid of falling in social standing, we act in a prudent manner. And Smith says it's, it, that's virtuous to take care of yourself. It is, it is right and fit that it should be so. And here's our first uh, glimpse at how Austin seems to be influenced in, and channeling Smith. There's a character in Mansfield Park, Fanny Price, who says, we all have a better guide in ourselves if we would attend to it than any other person can be. Very similar to the language that we find in Theory of Moral Sentiments. One of the characters that we see as being prudent is from Pride and Prejudice, Charlotte Lucas. Poor Charlotte ends up marrying the ridiculous Mr. Collins because that's the prudent path in terms of her, her safety net. You know, back then women didn't, couldn't own property, so the best way they could provide for themselves later in life would be to marry uh, into a comfortable position. And Elliot is also a prudent character from Persuasion, the novel. Uh, she, her, 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 her sister and her father spend the family into near bankruptcy and it's up to Anne to come up with a plan to, to save the family estate. And uh, she's perhaps a little too prudent in her relationships. She, uh, uh, she doesn't marry the love of her life early on um, in the novel because her family thinks he's not a good enough match for her. <coughs> Now the aforementioned Fanny from Mansfield Park is perceived to be imprudent when she turns down the proposal from Henry uh, Crawford. Fanny is a, uh, comes from a large poor family and her rich aunt and uncle take her in and raise her almost as one of their own. And so her uncle thinks it's very odd when Fanny turns down the proposal because you know, that's her way of, you know, of supporting herself. Um, he follows up and he, he scolds her, he tells her, oh, you, you don't know what you're doing. He sends her back home to live with her poor family for a little while so she might come to her senses. And she is thought, thought, to, thought to be imprudent. Now on to benevolence and then justice. When most people hear the word benevolence associated with Adam Smith, this is the quote that comes to mind, right? The most famous quote from Adam Smith. It's not from the benevolence of the butcher and the brewer and the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. But that's really a, a caricature of, of Smith because in Theory of Moral Sentiments, Smith tells us that it's human perfection to care for others instead of ourselves to restrain our selfish affections. That's the perfection of human nature. A very different, uh, d very different uh, point of view than the, the, the Wealth of Nations version. Now with justice, Smith uh, cuts right to the chase. Pay your debts on time, give people what they're due. 
that's the that's the his concept of justice he draws a distinction between justice and benevolence justice is the very foundation without justice our human society would crumble in a moment into atoms justice is the foundation we must have justice it is it is incumbent on all of us to be just benevolence though is the ornament that embellishes the building not the foundation so it's nice to have it's nice to be benevolent but it's not required we tend to be benevolent then towards people we care about but we're just um, to all so we see Ter Sir Thomas from Mansfield Park as both benevolent and just towards his his ward Fanny as I mentioned already he takes Fanny in uh, from her poor family at one point in the novel she's invited to uh, dinner at the estate next door and he insists that a carriage be uh, arranged for to take her over there even though her aunt Norris says it's too expensive he throws a ball for her when her uh, brother William comes to town and despite her refusal of Henry Crawford so he, he goes in and he scolds her and then he sends her off uh, out for a walk in the garden thinking that that she's going to change her mind but before he sends her off he notices and he asks her why isn't there a fire in your room and she responds oh well, there's never a fire Aunt Norris won't have it um, it's too expensive and so when she comes back from her walk after he scolded her for not uh, saying yes to Henry she notices that there's a fire and when she asks the chambermaid about it she says oh yes Sir Thomas has arranged for that fire to be there every day so even though he was upset with her and she thought she was being imprudent he was still benevolent and just to her now on to this thing called self-command According to Smith, self-command is, from, is the, the virtue that springs forth the other virtues. So it is the root. Now, self-command uh, is not really something that we use today. Maybe we use self-control. Uh, so I, I, I've got a little commercial here that my co-author found. There were these string of commercials back in the 50s. You can see it's back black and white, 40s and 50s, where, I guess 50s with TV, and uh, for this medicine called Anison that was supposed to relieve your headache and help you to regain your self-command. So let's have a look at this uh, commercial. So, so Anison helps her gain her self-command and then she's nice to her mom again. There's a whole series of these commercials. You can look them up on YouTube. But sometimes in modern day, self-control kind of gets a bad rap. Oh, you're repressing your emotions. You're not being true to your feelings. You know, you, you're just, you're, you're holding it in and it's going to blow one day. But we don't, Smith doesn't see it that way. Oops. Um, he sees it as, as an important part of your moral development. And we're going to look at the two sisters from Sense and Sensibility to get a feel for what is this thing called self-command and how is it perhaps different from self-control. 
we have Eleanor, who's the epitome of sense, meaning reason. And then we have Marianne, who gives us the example of the passions, sensibility, sense, hence the title, sense and sensibility. And I should just point out that in Austin's time, sensibility, and in Smith's time, meant sensitive, not reasonable, not sensible, sensitive, so sensitive towards others. Both uh, sisters have love interests in the novel, and both sisters at least seem to be jilted by their love interests. But the two reactions are completely different. So we'll look at the reaction of Eleanor to her, her when she thinks she's lost Edward, and Marianne when she's lost Willoughby. Eleanor, uh, when, when Edward leaves the, uh, the, the, the estate, the, the home, uh, her, her security sunk, but her self-command did not sink with it. So Austen herself uses that, th those words, self-command. She's calm. She's, she's upset, but she's not having fits of grief. Marianne, on the other hand, Marianne, even before Willoughby jilts her, she flouts her relationship with Will Willoughby so much that Eleanor tries to take her aside and say, you know, you might want to tone it down a little. <laughs> You're being a little improper. But uh, Marianne would have none of, none of it. She abhorred all concealment. So let's look at the two sisters in their reaction when they meet up with Willoughby in London after Marianne is, is jilted. Mr. Willoughby. She has no self-command. After, after she realizes that Willoughby is lost, lost to her, she hides away in her room. She's crying all the time. She makes herself physically ill, almost to the point of death. But according to Smith, the best cure for grief is engagement. Go out and about. Be social. Be with, be with strangers, because then you're more likely to, to put up a, a happier face. And, uh, and then you'll be more likely to get over your, your troubles. And that's what, uh, that's what Eleanor does. When Edward leaves, Marianne uh, notes that, that Eleanor's self-command is invariable. When does she try to avoid society? So Eleanor is taking a Smithian approach to getting uh, over her, uh, her, her seeming loss of Edward. She stays engaged and busy. She even becomes other-directed 
after her initial shock of, of, of learning that uh, she won't be able to marry Edward, he, she actually starts feeling sorry for Edward that he's going to marry the vulgar Lucy Steele. So she becomes other directed. But it doesn't come easily. Self-command is a decision that Eleanor makes. And it's, it becomes with effort and, and exertion. So self-command isn't just repressing your feelings and white knuckling it. Instead, it's more like sailing. When a sailor sails, he uses the sails to harness the wind, to govern the wind. He doesn't control the wind, but he governs the wind to, so that the boat takes him where he wants to go. Likewise, when we have self-command, we govern our passions to take us in the right direction. But even Eleanor has her lapse in self-command when she finds out that Edward really is in love with her and available. So let's take a look at Eleanor's lapse. Thank you. Oh, no, Barry. when I was very young. Had I had an active profession, I should never have felt such a idle, foolish inclination. My behavior at Norman was very wrong. But I convinced myself that you felt any friendship for me, and, and that it was my heart alone that I was risking. I, I've come here with no expectations, only to profess now that I am at liberty to do so that my heart is and always will be yours. So, Jane Austen does, doesn't have Eleanor break down like that fully in the book. In the book, uh, she just could barely compose herself as she leaves the room, almost ran out the door, but as soon as the door was closed, she bursts into tears of joy. And you know, Adam Smith would be okay with that. Smith tells us that in his discussion of self-demand, self-command, that the indulgence of even of such excessive affections is, upon many occasions, not only agreeable, but delicious. And when we read that, uh, that uh, part of, of Sense and Sensibility or see the, the, the scene with Eleanor finally uh, getting her happiness, um, we smile because it's delicious. Now in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the vices, so sorry if you were looking for a little bit of that, but we do outline, we do map in characters and plot lines to the three vices of vanity, pride, and greed. So I will just skip through those and, and look on to how do we develop the virtues and avoid the vices? How do we go about our moral development. Smith gives us this concept of an impartial spectator. We develop something called an impartial spectator that keeps us in line. And the, we learn what's right and wrong through a feedback mechanism. Um, we remember our bumper sticker uh, of, of Smith's theory. We want to look in the mirror and like what we see. We want approval from others. We want praise. And so we're happy when people approve of our behavior, and we're upset when people disapprove of our behavior. And so getting that feedback from others teaches us, us what's right and wrong. 
After a while, we don't need others to judge our behavior. We develop an internal impartial spectator and we judge ourselves. And so we internalize that feedback mechanism. Smith and Austin call it approbation and disapprobation. Today we would call it approval and disapproval. So I'm going to show you another clip, this one from a, a movie adaptation of Emma, sorry not Clueless, uh, another one, where Emma gets feedback about her behavior. There, it's a famous uh, scene from the book uh, called The Outing at Box Hill. So they've gone out for a picnic and it's Emma and a bunch of her friends. The, uh, uh, the, one of the key people in the, in the scene is a character called Miss Bates. Miss Bates is a, a spinster who lives with her widowed mother. Their station in life has fallen a bit since, quite a bit, since her father passed away. And, uh, and they'll, it'll probably sink more as they age. But nonetheless, she's still part of the, the society in Highbury. And uh, they're out on this picnic. She's a bit tire of a tiresome person, though. Uh, but yeah, everybody tolerates her because she's so nice. And um, another character in there that's of importance would be Mr. Knightley. We model Mr. Knightley as Emma's impartial spectator in the book. So let's see some, some disapprobation that Emma receives for her behavior. I have some wonderful news. I have found a position for you. It is with a choice family in Bath, and the position is one I'm most obliged to, but I would not consider leaving the library. As a protector, I cannot allow you to feel that way. I'm sure everyone agrees with me. What are your options? After all, Jane? Hmm? These sandwiches are delicious, Mrs. Elton. You really are a gourmet. <laughs> well, I never compliment myself, but my friends tell me I certainly know how to make a sandwich. <laughs> now, Jane, shall we all play a game? I command that we each tell Miss Woodhouse something entertaining. You may offer one thing very clever, two things moderately clever, or three things very dull indeed. <laughs> but in return, Miss Woodhouse will laugh heartily at them all. <laughs> I do not pretend to be a wit, though I have a great deal of diversity in my own way, of course. These diversions are tolerable at Christmas when one is around the fire, but in my opinion, it wastes the outdoors. Miss Woodhouse, you must excuse me. And me. I'm an old married man. There's nothing to say that would please Miss Woodhouse. No. Or any young lady. Oh, well, I may not be uneasy, as long as we're allowed to read dull things. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> you could cut that awkward wrist with a knife. Um, in case Emma didn't get the nonverbal communication from her friends, Mr. Knightley takes her aside afterwards and says, very badly done, Emma. Badly done indeed. So much so that Emma cries on the way home in the carriage. And the Bates family is uh, uh, another example of Smith uh, being reflected in, in, in Austin. The Bates, uh, he, he, Knightley tells Emma that one of the reasons why we should respect Miss Bates is because she has sunk so low in social standing and will probably sink more and yet she still is a good person. And that's what Smith tells us. Smith tells us that the people we should admire, well, some of the people that we should admire the most are people who have fallen in, in, in social standing and yet still remain of good character and conduct.
So very reminiscent of the Bates. So this impartial spectator, Emma receives the feedback from Knightley and then she internalizes it. Later on in the novel, when she reaches out to Jane Fairfax, who she's never really liked all that much, she thinks to herself, oh, if only Mr. Knightley could see what, how nice I'm being to Jane, he would be so pleased. So she's now internalized that feedback mechanism from her not so impartial spectator. All right, well, the last thing that I wanted to look at uh, with you today is the link between Austen and Smith and what we call today bourgeois virtue and dignity. This is based on uh, the work that Deirdre McCloskey has done. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. That Deirdre McCloskey has done uh, on books called Bur Bourgeois Virtue, Bourgeois Dignity, soon to come out, Bourgeois Equality. So McCloskey builds on Smith to give us a, a, a nice treatment of the importance that respect for business has in society. And we see changing attitudes about business in Austin. So McCloskey's, one of McCloskey's, part of McCloskey's theory is that the big increase in economic growth that we saw around Austin and Smith's time was due not just to technology, not just to trade, but due to changing attitudes about business. And again, we see this reflected in Austin. Smith tells us that in pre-commercial society, to trade was seen as disgraceful. To, to give something away is, is good, but to barter and trade is seen as, as, as in a negative way. And he says, even in a refined society, that, that disdain for trade doesn't completely go away. And if you think about it, I mean, who's most likely to be the villain in a movie these days? except for zombies, right? um, businessmen. Right? So we still see that today. The businessmen in Mansfield Park are seen as impunctual, fraudulent, uh, remote. It's much better to put your business in with somebody that you know instead of leaving it into the hands of a professional man. Sir William Lucas in Pride and Prejudice embodies this disdain for business. He had made a tolerable fortune in trade, but as soon as he gets his knighthood, he, he views it with disgust. He moves his family to Lucas Lodge, where he can be unshackled by business. You saw that couple, the, the, Wal the, the Eltons, uh, in the Box Hill uh, movie clip. The Eltons' reputation is, is a little tainted because of their alliances with trade. The Cole family and Emma gives us an interesting glimpse into this changing attitude about trade. They're described as very good sort of people, friendly, liberal, and unpretending, but on the other hand, they were of low origin in trade and only moderately genteel. However, when, uh, when the Coles throw a big party, Emma is struggling. She's trying to figure out how can she possibly turn their invitation down because it's not for them to determine the terms on which the better families would visit them. She changes her tune when everybody in Highbury gets invited except her and her dad. <laughs> then all of a sudden she wants to go to the coal party. Uh -huh. So, uh, but Smith tells us Virtue and commerce are not s separate arenas. That the road to virtue and the road to fortune is in most cases very neatly the same because honesty is the best policy when you're doing business. Now in, in some of the novels we start to see this glimmer of respect for business. Specifically General Tilney in Northanger Abbey. His sons will inherit the Abbey, Northanger Abbey. And yet he insists that his, his sons have professions. Because if the money is not enough, you have to be productive in order to flourish. We see the respect for business and the disdain for business embodied in Emma and Mr. Knightley's impressions of a character, Mr. Robert Martin. 
<coughs> Robert Martin is smitten with Emma's protege Harriet, but, ha but Emma doesn't think that Mr. Mr. Martin is good enough for her friend. She says he's a completely gross, vulgar farmer, totally inattentive to appearances and thinking nothing but profit and loss. Mr. Martin is a, a tenant farmer on, on Mr. Knightley's estate. But Mr. Knightley sees him as a respectable, intelligent, gentleman farmer who Harriet would be proud to be married to. So we see both sides of the coin uh, in their impressions of, of Robert Martin. So what are some lessons then we can draw from Smith and Austin? Have self-command so that we can live a life balanced between sense and sensibility. Have your reason, but also have your passions. Be prudent, but not to the extent of miserliness, like Mrs. Norris, who wouldn't let Fanny have a carriage or a fire. Show benevolence to people we care about, but justice for all. <coughs> have pride in our true accomplishments, but not so much that we become vain or greedy. Give people who earn it respect. Give the bourgeoisie their dignity. And finally, take enlightenment themes to heart by thinking for ourselves, tolerating others, and always striving for improvement. So thank you very much. I hope you would check out our Facebook page and our website.